You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the 20th edition of the Center Steer Podcast. My name is John Cossett, your host here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Summer has finally arrived. It is warm, it is hot, and occasionally muggy. The rain has ended. Uh, the monsoon season ran for almost all the last month and finally have dried out. So Don't uh, jinx it by talking about it. We need rain. Rain is good. Rain, green, rain creates green and uh, and drinkable water. We need it to dry out once in a while too. We do. We do. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, sitting across from me is I'm Harold, and also via Skype is Hey, I'm Morgan from Vermont. How's it going? And our guest this month is all the way from Central Mexico. That is the country of Mexico, old uh, Mexico, not new Mexico. By the name of Sean Regan. Hi, guys. Yes, this is Sean Reagan from San Miguel de Allende. Nice, nice, nice uh, you say accent that there. like a local. Yeah, that's kick-ass. We'll talk to Sean later in the podcast, but first, the news. And first up to talk about, uh, well, I would, did, would like to remind everybody and mention that we are part of the 4x4 radio network, which includes XJ Podcast, which uh, has renamed itself to The Jeep Podcast, and the uh, Muddy Microphone Mud, uh, Podcast, which is all about ATVs, and the 4x4 Podcast with Dan Cole, which is all about all things uh, 4x4. Dan's been on the show, and I would recommend that you uh, go out and listen to episode 103 of his podcast. He talks about uh, taking his family, relocating from Kansas City, I think, all the way up to uh, Alaska. So he took that trip. So this was a first kind of hot wash of that trip and what he went through and the things he experienced. And it was a good one. You should check it out. Episode 103 of the uh, 4x4 podcast, which is on the 4x4 radio network. <laughs> I have trouble keeping that straight. I was following his uh, Facebook feed of the, of the not only the trip, but the, the preparations for it, and, and the, he actually built a trailer for that expedition. And first up in official news, and we're going to start with two stories that are not Land Rover related, uh, but they, uh, they are in the indirectly Land Rover. First is a Jeep was electronically, wirelessly, over the cellular network, hacked uh, in St. Louis from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, of all places. And uh, they controlled the vehicle. They stopped the vehicle. They disabled the vehicle. They moved it around. They changed the radio station. They put on the washers and the uh, the wipers so the the, uh, the driver couldn't see anything. And of course, not that the driver could do anything at that point. And uh, so this is the and as a result, uh, Fiat Chrysler, which owns Jeep, has issued a recall of one point no fourteen point four million cars because they have that UConnect system, which is their right. their infotainment system, and that's what allowed the uh, they hacked in through the entertainment system. They did, they did, because yeah. basically the car has an, has a has an IP address. They right. found the IP address and they pounded on it, and they were able to gain access. Found to a it. way to cross over into the other systems on the car. Were they able to shut the engine off? I didn't hear that. Uh, I think so. Okay. I did. I I know they were able to stop the vehicle. They could steer. Their, they they uh, it's steering. That's scary. But I think they could only steer it backwards. They said they had problems trying to steer it forwards. Uh, but they were only able to get it to steer in reverse. But they figured eventually they that's would be able to. Still more than they should be doing. It's a mm-hmm. yeah, hell of a lot a, more. That's a scary thing. I would assume a lot of the steering stuff is related to like automatic parallel parking oh, sure. options and that's, stuff like that. That's why it works the reverse. reverse. Yeah. Um, I've actually seen some uh, previous research that they have done in this area uh, where they they basically hacked in via the FM radio. So this is sort of the first where they've gone directly over the internet to get into these vehicles and. In previous ones, they've even been able to, you know, deploy the airbag at low speeds and all sorts of stuff. So, well, I think some scary. Some of those past vulnerabilities have been fixed. I think the, this is a more of a general you know, vulnerability of the entire system uh, versus like those individual systems. But they've been tying more and more together too with these inf- infotainment systems and the just the general vehicle control. Yeah, the fact so. that those two can be tied together, and if you breach into the entertainment, you have access to everything. That's that's pretty scary. Yep, and uh, I there was I don't have the article in front of me, but I know almost pretty quickly Congress uh, said we need to have a rule of laws and controls about this. Which uh, yeah, but <sighs> manufacturers should also be doing this on their own. Certainly need to have some discussion yeah. about it. Yeah, 
Yeah, they should be, you know, taking security into heavy consideration when building these. How long have you been in IT? Uh, oh, geez, uh, a long time at my current position. I've been there like 12 years. So. And how many times has security been considered from the get-go? Exactly. Uh... Exactly. <laughs> how many times have we learned from past mistakes? Exactly. Yeah, I'm sorry. Also being in IT and in security, these things, it's like... You saw it coming. You well, saw it coming. We didn't used to think that securing our air travel system was all that important either. Exactly. Until there was a problem. Until there was a problem, right. And But this one, you could have anticipated that if you have you put the car and give it an IP address and you put it on the, the Internet and you have those systems even remotely connected, right. someone's going to find a way. You, just, right. you know it's going to happen. So you could have taken better measures ahead of time. Yeah. Moving on, uh, FCA and Tata will build a new Jeep vehicle in India from 2017. And uh, FCA is, is Jeep. Uh, that's uh, the Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. They're going to have a joint venture. They already ha- do have a joint venture with Tata, but this specific one is with Tata to build a Jeep in India beginning in 2017. So Land Rover and Jeep will be cousins. At least in India. Yes. Uh, this will be the fourth plant to build Jeeps out- outside of the United States. I, which I didn't know that. Jeep models are currently built in India, Brazil, and will begin production in China <laughs> uh, in the fourth quarter of this They're year. They're also making them in Italy, too, aren't they? Yes. At a did Fiat I, plant? Did I say that? You I said yeah. India. Oh, I, oh, I'm sorry. Italy. I apologize. Yeah, Italy, Brazil, and China, and now India. And, and India, yeah. So those three. So that is the non-Land Rover news. Uh, moving into uh, Land Rover news specifically, uh, I, I, Bloomberg View had an article which I really liked uh, that is ca- entitled RIP Land Rover's Defender, the greatest car ever. And it's all the things we've ever talked about Defenders about. It's, it's hard all- to go wrong with a title like that. Exactly. This is the perfect article to show your friends uh, as to if, who don't understand why you have the disease, why you, 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 you love your Defender or your Land Rover in general, specifically Land Defender in this case, and why, why you cling to it uh, more than anything else in the world, which I think Sean can attest to. Um, so this is a great article. It'll be on our, of course, I'll have a link to it in the show notes if you want to show your friends. Because this is so much easier than taking them on a trip and just resolving all doubt. True. Right, Sean? Yes. <laughs> Although, in the, in the article, aren't they talking about the newer version of the Defender that, w- that looks kind of like the Land Cruiser? Uh, it, it, it's, he is talking about an updated one because I know the writer was from Austria or Germany. Uh, I think he was talking about the kind of the more the current model, but the underpinnings are still there from going back, you know, all, all the way. Uh, yeah. But not the, not the brandy new one that we have not okay. seen. Yeah, that's, it's not the upcoming one. It's a reference to the one they're making now, but will be soon not making. I see. Excellent. Hence the rest in peace, the R.I.P., and speaking of the soon to not be making Land Rover, uh, it was re- it was reported that Land Rover was extending current Defender production beyond January of sixteen into February or possibly even into April. But then the next day, another story came out saying that Land Rover has dismissed speculation about continuing Defender production. So uh, I guess the Birmingham Post had an article, had an anonymous source inside, probably a worker on a Defender line. They're working two Defender lines now, I believe, and production is uh, is up. Um, I think they made – wish I had – I should have to find that information. Uh, I believe they made 14,000 cars in 2014, and they're already at 17,000 now, and that's right. halfway through the and year. And they've stopped taking orders already. Uh, correct. So I guess a worker said that they were going to extend production to meet the demand. But then, uh, as I said, the next day, Land Rover came out, and this is the, their quote. Defender production in Sully Hall is now entering its final phase. We have not confirmed an end to date for UK production. However, we do not expect this to continue past the end of January 2016. So take all that for what you will. And, and wait for any news stories that might, might uh, update that. Yes, and listen to this podcast. Uh, On a monthly basis, we'll keep you up to date. (laughs) We'll do our best. Uh, Also, uh, on Land Rover uh, JLR News, uh, they are partnering with Magna Steyr. Did I say that correctly? I believe you did. Uh, An Austrian company best known uh, for uh, producing other vehicles like the G-Wagon and the Pinsgauer. And so um, apparently there's some speculation 
that maybe Defender Production would be taken up by these folks, whether that's the new one or the old one. It's not clear. All, all that we know is that there's a relationship now between uh, Land Rover and Magna Steyr. Well, the, the Pinsgauer is a badass truck al- along the lines of the FC 101. So I think cloning that or uh, mixing that together with a Defender body would be something really incredible. Yeah, I don't think we would get any complaints for something like that. Not that, for me. That would be awesome. <laughs> and don't forget, you'll have to wait 25 years to drive it, unless you go to Europe. That might be yeah, worth the price of a ticket. One can move. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be worth the price of a ticket just to go over and take a yeah, test drive. Yeah, probably would be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, moving around the world to China. Uh, we had reported this before, but we had some new information on it. The Land Win, which is their version of the Evoque uh, is coming to production and is going to be in the hands of uh, Chinese consumers, I believe this month or next month, so it might be August or September. Uh, and so it's coming out. It's going to have a four-speed, no, excuse me, a two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine. Uh, output will be 188 horsepower, uh, which is less than the 237 horsepower for the current Evoque. So that's, a lot less. Yes. I suspect that's probably not the only shortcoming. <laughs> I believe the cost is also significantly less, and I think that's reflected in the uh, in the horsepower. They do not have a price here, so I can't report that to you. It's a cheap Chinese knockoff, in my opinion. That would be the land win. That's what it sounds like. Yep. Uh, rolling back to the United States of America, the uh, 2015 Disco Sport has been reviewed by Autoblog, uh, which I one of the first uh, reviews I have seen of it. And they generally liked the vehicle. I uh, thought it was you know good fit and finish, well put together. Uh, they're really the only quibble about it uh, was that the transmission likes to hunt uh, through all its gears. Uh, it was a nice little reading here that uh, the transmission hunts through gears at low speeds as if it's determined to use all of its gears just because it has them. It can, so it does. Kind of sounds like a Land Rover, too, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. it does. And it is a nine-speed transmission. So that's coming. Uh, also, uh, Harold and I went to the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix last weekend, and um, I took my series, uh, Series 3109. Harold had a Defender, and uh, we enjoyed the show. It was a lot of fun uh, to see. Uh, we got there, what, 9, 1030. 1030. We 1030. We didn't move from the spot for two hours to, to go. We couldn't go look at it. We couldn't leave. All of, Everybody just, as soon as the... We got swarmed. Got, we got swarmed. People just came out of the woodwork and were there. Unlike, now, last year when we went, it had been raining so much that they we had to wait like two hours to get onto the field and there was a third of the normal people there this year was nice warm and hot and people just swarmed us and and we did i don't think we moved till about one o'clock and i'm like here we gotta go let's go look at these other vehicles and so we walked around and in walking around uh we came upon the uh, local um, dealership tent they had all the line up there for uh, jag and land rover and they had a uh, disco sport and it was open we got to sit in it and look around and we even popped the hood and looked under the hood and opened the rear tailgate and um looked at the electric seat back releases oh that's right those are pretty cool yeah 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 on the, yeah instead of uh instead of actually reaching the extra foot and pulling a manual release you had a little button there to push and then the seat would fling would like pop forward yeah, so it was, a, it was electric release from the open the tailgate, and there's a two buttons on the inside. You'd push those, and depending on which one you wanted, the seat would then pop forward. So yeah, and as Harold said, instead of opening the back door, the side door, reaching in with your hand, yeah, it was kind of cool. Uh, it was fairly convenient. It, w- it was a convenience thing. It also had a power tailgate, as I recall, too. Yes, that's pretty much standard anymore. Yeah, that's becoming the, the norm. The norm, yeah. The uh, pano roof was pretty cool. It looked like a fixed pano roof on the inside. Uh, that uh, you know, It was in. fixed, but the view was phenomenal. Yes, it was. Uh, the inside of a tent, in our case. Um, I, my general view of it, it was great fit and finish, good-looking vehicle, but it wasn't distinctive. It was not. It looks like every other modern vehicle out there. Well, it's losing some of its uh, roverness, if you will. I. Yes, I completely agree. And the price is, uh, I mean, it's a lot of truck, but it, is, it may be worth it to some people, but it seemed pretty expensive was to what, me. Was that one fifty three? Fifty five thousand dollars $55,000. Yeah, that seemed to be, a, that's, that's. For, yeah. for a uh, light duty disco, if you will. Yeah. Being a disco sport, it's a glorified right. Freelander. Right, exactly. Nothing wrong with a Freelander. And uh, how did it compare in size to, you know, a Freelander? 
uh, physically larger or bigger, same size? Bigger than a Freelander, smaller than a, than a new Disco. Yep. It was not significantly bigger, I think, than a uh, Freelander, but it was significantly smaller than a Disco. I think it was significantly bigger than the original Freelander, maybe not oh. the LR2, the, yeah. the, the second Freelander. But it definitely felt wider, and it definitely felt longer. And it's, uh, I think all some of the modern Land Rovers have this bulbous front end feel to them. Like they kind of flare out and, and have this rounded front. It has that yeah. to it. Um, but it has a sideways four-cylinder engine like a Freelander would. Yeah, right. But so it was, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a car. It was Land Rover. It was okay, but it wasn't okay. really worth getting excited about other than the yeah. fact that it was a chance to see one. Yes, exactly. I mean, mind you, if I was driving it, I might have different opinions, but just sitting there looking at it, I'm sort of middle of the road. So if we were to take it to Iceland and try to uh, forward a stream, that might, that might change our opinions. Maybe. Yeah. I think I'd rather take my 55 and, and buy a vintage Defender and fix it up. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I think, yeah, yeah that's definitely the sentiment of, uh, I think, the folks who would listen to this podcast would think the same thing. So, And as a previous, you know, first-gen Freelander owner, uh, how does it compare to something like that? Obviously, that was a, a more low-end vehicle. Uh, you know, the, my, my one complaint with... Uh, with the with the Freelander that I had, uh, and I was not a you know big Land Rover person at the time. Uh, you, you had this expectation here in North America that Land Rover is kind of high end luxury, and the Freelander didn't didn't have any of that. So I was like, I expected more luxury out of it. Uh, but I did like the vehicle. You know, I loved it. I still think about it. It's a nice. It was an enjoyable vehicle. This uh, the Disco Sport, however, has that luxury feel to it. Uh, you know, stitching and. This was, I think, the HSE model, so uh, I think that we saw. So it's possible maybe some of the other models. That I think are... you could get it cheaper if you didn't have maybe all of the bells and whistles is... of the HSE. Right, but it, to, to your point, it, Morgan, to answer your question, it did feel higher end uh, and luxurious, I suppose. Now, on the other end, if you wanted a cheaper one, what would you give up? Because all the things in it were pretty cool. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, moving on to uh, other Land Rover new model news, uh, a Land Rover dealership in Boise, Idaho, has done a video review of the 2016 Range Rover Diesel. So the nice thing about this is there is a diesel Range Rover in North America. And they're driving it. Yes. It's being used. And uh, all the things you would think are in, are in effect. Uh, great low-end torque, uh, excellent uh, petrol gas mileage. Um, I think she, the lady that did the review said it was 23, 28, and she at some point even got 31 on the highway at Actually, some point. Actually, it'll get infinite mileage to the petrol. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but fuel mileage, on the other hand. Fuel mileage, thank you. And uh, so she, did, she seemed to really enjoy it. You know, good for towing, of course, and all the things you would think that you would do with a diesel, but now in a, in a uh, Range Rover and clean, uh, and doesn't smell. And, and she went to know. great lengths to explain the difference between torque and horsepower in the review well torque as i recall is uh what initial power well torque is instantaneous it's the ability to to move the vehicle at any time whereas horsepower is how much of that torque you can use at a over time hmm. so torque gets you moving horsepower keeps you moving hmm. there we go so that's the short answer that's right answer it's a good answer w without the science yeah no, no, that's fine Speaking of diesels, uh, these are uh, general articles about diesels that I thought were interesting since we, we lust after diesels here, especially in North America. Uh, diesels easily trump gas for total cost of ownership. This is also on Autoblog. And uh, kind of the general uh, theme of this was that while a diesel may cost you two, three, four, maybe even seven grand more to purchase, and uh, parts and repairs can, and even fuel can be more costly than, than its uh, petrol equivalent. Over time, in this case, three to five years, total cost of ownership can actually, in fact, be less uh, by owning diesel. And, in diesel. fact, the longer the time period, the, the better the deal is for diesel. And that is because? Uh, well, you've got an engine that's going to last at least twice as long. So you can right. you know, put a lot of life into, uh, into right. a diesel engine that you can't with the gasoline. That's a good point. And, right. and over time, they hold their resale value better. That's definitely true, right? So it's it's good in the short run, but it's also uh, really good in the long run. 
and the fuel cost difference uh, depends on really uh, where you are because it's priced differently in different states. In some places it's more, in some places it's less. But in general, right now it seems to be sort of right in the in the same neighborhood with gasoline, like between regular and premium. Right, right. Yeah, I think I've been paying three oh nine here in the Pittsburgh area for the last six months. And, and given that your mileage is so much higher, the the actual fuel cost per mile is still lower with the diesel. And uh, further, uh, another article that the BBC had. And this is a little more lengthy one, but uh, kind of a, a, kind of a negative on diesels was: Is it time to switch to a cleaner fuel? And the point of this article, the theme, was that uh, while, yes, diesels have been cleaner and they're better and, and, and such things, uh, however, the NO2 levels, uh, however, have not been brought down considerably. That's like the next thing to work on, if you will, uh, is to uh, help clean up the NO2, which is what, nitrous That's oxide? Oxygen, oxides of nitrogen. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and that is actually very tricky to control with the diesel because it's it happens... Be, uh, let me see how to explain this. Uh, it's dependent upon the exhaust gas temperature primarily, and diesels tend to have a lot more high temperature exhaust gas. And so that it's hard to make a diesel not produce oxides of nitrogen. It's still a problem with gasoline engines, but generally speaking, that's taken care of in the catalytic converter. Mm. With, well, with the diesel, you have to employ some different strategies. It's, it is manageable, but it's more difficult. Is that the urea that helps with that? Uh, the urea actually is part of the particulate Hmm. mechanism. There's a, a fi uh, like an after filter that uh, filters out the particulate matter, the soot, the little black particles that you see. Those collect over time, and then the, the urea is used to burn those out of the trap in what they call a re regeneration cycle. Okay. Hmm. Uh, your Volkswagen, on the other hand, does not use urea. It, it has a different strategy. It actually uses diesel fuel, hmm. injects a little bit of diesel fuel late in the cycle, and that overheats the particulate filter and burns the soot out that way. Nice. So apparently uh, some European cities, uh, it has been reported by the WHO that NO2 levels are more than double guide with WHO guidelines with diesel vehicles, the single greatest contributor. So I guess uh, we might see diesels as a another targeted uh, for cleanup. Uh, uh, yeah, I think, cleanup. but they already are cleaning that up in, in most uh, modern markets with the, the newer electronically controlled diesels. Uh, the, the problem is you have so many older diesels still in circulation, and I think they're the lion's share of the problem, and the new vehicles uh, may produce a lot less, but it's going to take time for those to replace the older ones. Especially since they can... last longer. Since exactly, they're, because they're they last engines. so long. Yeah, yeah. It's, you've got an engine that lasts 500,000 miles. It's going to take a while before you update Swap enough. Swap out the whole fleet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah, good point. I hadn't thought about that. Is there other ways to retrofit those, or, or is that, again, that's an expense? And It's an expense, you know. and it's a little tricky with the older systems to, to make the, the necessary changes. And I don't think you're going to have any incentive for people to do it. Probably not. Are you, are you guys familiar with the 2.2-liter diesel defenders they have down here? That would be the TDCI? 2.2-liter, uh, they call it the Puma? The Puma engine, yeah. It seems pretty efficient and powerful, no? Uh, it's a good engine. We can't get them here, so I can't tell you much about them. Cool. I heard that it gets 28 miles per gallon and has the same amount of horsepower as my 3.9 liter V8 and a little more torque, and it's a four-cylinder. Well, mind you, your 3.9 is not known for its high power output, so... That's true. <laughs> Are you considering switching? Oh my gosh! I don't have seventy nine thousand dollars <laughs> for overlanding. I would love the efficiency. Sure. I bet there's a back alley shop somewhere in Mexico that could do it a lot cheaper than seventy nine k. Right. <laughs> and I did get a chance to ride in one of the twenty twelve Puma uh, Defender one tens uh, last year, last summer, going down to the Vermont Roverland Expo or whatever it was. Is that one uh, of the the demonstration units that Rovers it, North had? That was, yeah, and it was definitely powerful, and, and we, uh, we definitely uh, flew down the highway, and uh, it did not guzzle fuel like we would have expected. Yeah, they get the cool toys up there. Yep. Yeah. And how was the ride on that one, Morgan? Uh, it was quite comfortable. Obviously, the interior is uh, significantly modernized, but, you know, 
space wise it's not that big a change so it doesn't feel that different obviously much smoother I think ride it's though probably difficult to really accurately assess the comfort of the ride when you're too busy drooling <laughs> exactly <laughs> Although I will say the the doors did not leak, the floor definitely pooled with drool. So what? <laughs> That's not a Land Rover. Come on, if it's not if it's raining and it's not raining inside, come on. Uh, that was actually a very rainy weekend, so I was very happy to to be dry. to experience working door seals. <laughs> yeah, for six weeks or so. Yep. <laughs> and I'm sure they've upgraded the suspension on that thing too. Uh, I can't recall, but it, it was fairly nice. I don't think it's significantly different. No? Okay. But you haven't had a lot of seat time in a coil-sprung rover yet either. So. I have not, at least not a not, not a 1987 anyway. So I had a 2001 coil-sprung. But yeah. yeah, different. Yeah, it was. And I have an update in the ongoing saga of the federally seized Land Rovers. Uh, I think last time we, we discussed that the case had been dismissed and those rovers had been returned. Uh, but if you remember, when we first broke the story, we discussed, in fact, I think we talked about it a couple of years ago in our podcast, but uh, about two and a half years ago, there was a raid of the shop of Dr. Aaron Richarde, the importer that was involved in this case. And the federal government seized all kinds of trucks and all kinds of parts and, and of course, his records, which they, they used to find the trucks that they seized last year. Um, since uh, Will Hedrick, Defender of Defenders, was so successful at getting the 40 seized trucks dismissed and returned, he then turned his attention to w the uh, original raid of March, of March, I think it was, early 2013, and he was able to get those trucks that were seized returned to their rightful owners because many of those trucks were actually private individuals who had had them there to be worked on by, by Dr. Aaron and his crew. They hadn't imported them through him. Uh, well, whether they had or not, that was not the issue, but the, the government had come in and just taken them without warrant, without process. They'd just taken them as part of the raid of his shop. And in fact, there was, uh, was that was uh, a difficult thing to chase down because there hadn't been a warrant. There was no official paper trail on these things. But Will being the tenacious badass lawyer that he is. Defender of defenders. Defender of defenders, indeed. He got those trucks returned. Nice. Excellent. Well done. Yes. And the other update I have in that story is that just yesterday, uh, there was a little gathering down in North Carolina for many of the seized trucks, uh, the ones from the warrant that were returned, because many of those were from the North Carolina area. They put together a little gathering, a little picnic, uh, invited Will to come out. They had a, you know, had a little party. They had a Defender-shaped cake there. And at the climax of the event, they presented the guest of honor, Will Hedrick, Defender of Defenders, with his very own Defender. They got together and they bought him wow. a Defender. Nice. <laughs> wow. Excellent. I, I don't have many de details on what it is. I believe it's a 110, uh, but that is so cool. Nice. Well, well done. Good job. That, that's that's really nice. And, and I'll Very put this out deserved. there. If that truck needs anything I can provide, you guys let me know. I will do it. After mine's done, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have to know where the parts are coming from. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's, it certainly is well deserved, and I remind everybody that there's a Kickstarter or no GoFundMe. There's a GoFundMe for uh, for Will to help uh, with his expenses uh, in this endeavor, since he did uh, quit his full time gig uh, to help uh, get these vehicles back. Yeah, and and now that the Defender of Defenders is now an owner of a Defender, he's going to need that money to keep his truck on the road. Yeah, it's true. Yes, yes, and he well he was a Land Rover enthusiast uh, prior to this, right? He actually had owned a truck at some point, uh, maybe maybe even a couple of them. But as I understood it, he did not currently own one, so that problem has been fixed. Good, good, excellent, good news. I thought so. That's excellent news. That's great news, and it's also the news. And we're back to the podcast. This is number twenty-eight of the Center Steer Podcast. Uh, I will now turn it over to Morgan for our heritage segment.
And I will have to actually defer on the heritage segment. Unfortunately, the uh, the holiday continues. Last month, I was actually on holiday. This month, it's just been a little too crazy. So well, we will well, have to catch that up next month. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, since you mentioned you were on holiday last month, did you make any progress on your heritage Land Rover? Uh, sadly, I did not. I needed a a, a, a long break from as much as many work projects as possible so that unfortunately was included and your rover is another work project to you uh not exactly uh but it does you know require a bit of extra travel and you know bloody knuckles and stuff like that so okay well i need to decompress it would be more work for me so i can relate to that <laughs> yeah it's not like he can walk downstairs into his uh, garage and you know or or drive a half a mile and you know, he's at the garage. I think that I think the best part of that would be the the drive across Vermont just to get to the project. Yeah. Oh, I I definitely enjoy the drive, and honestly, I I really like that I moved it 150 miles away because then I go and that's all I do when I go is work on it. Uh, and how was the Vol Volvo? Didn't you have a problem with the Volvo? Yeah, I had some major electrical issues the last couple of weeks. Uh, turned out to be an intermittent battery. And it's nice to have a warranty on those things, but not when they won't replace it because it seems like it's fine at the time. So until it really fails and strands <laughs> you. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Well, well, did you did you finally get that sorted out? Yeah, I, you know, replaced a lot of wiring and then finally got the battery to really fully fail and oh. got it swapped out, and now it's fine. You know, if you take a crescent wrench and you, you, you set it on those two metal posts on top of the battery, the battery's going to fail pretty quickly after that. Yeah, and, you know, it welds the crescent wrench to the top, so it's really uh, poor evidence against me. It's a handle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a lifting handle, yeah. <laughs> all right, no, no, no worries, Morgan. I uh, understand you were busy and things are going on, and, it, and this is all volunteer, so, uh, you know, it is what it is, right? Yeah, it so is. You get what you pay for. It's not like the information is going to expire. That's true. That's true. They're old trucks, after all. They'll only get older and better. Yes, yes it's like it's like fermentation process. There you go. <laughs> the information is fermenting one more month. <laughs> all right, then we will move to talk with our special guest, Sean Regan. He's a photographer, I think, by trade now, and uh, he's living in uh, central Mexico. And... Um, we heard about Sean from the Petrolicious uh, video that was done, I think, about two months ago called La Poderosa. I'm probably saying that incorrectly. And um, and Jeff uh, Aronson, our uh, friend of the show from uh, Rovers Magazine, put us in contact with Sean. And now Sean's on the show. Say hi, Sean. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. No worries. So La Poderosa, what does it mean and how did that happen? Okay. Well, La Poderosa means the powerful one. And we didn't name it, but we used to keep her in a, in a garage in town, and it was connected to a hotel where there were valets, and the valets would see her come in and leave, and we learned months into it that they had given her a name, La Poderosa, which I believe is also the name of uh, Che Guevara's motorcycle. That's, that's a cool story. That's you have to say, that's, that's really cool. Right. We hadn't named the vehicle until then. It just had to happen, and it, and it did. Do you do you actually call your your defender La Poderosa then as you uh, hey let's go take the Poderosa out? Absolutely, I do. When when I'm talking <laughs> with Mitty, we do, and when we write about it in articles, we do. Sure, that's cool. That's cool. I, I find it fascinating. Those are cool things. So, what is the Poderosa? What what exactly is it? It's a 1995 North American spec Land Rover Defender 90. And how did you acquire it, or where did you find it? I found it secondhand when I was living in the States. Uh, I believe it was actually in New York, and I was in Massachusetts. But uh, I got word of it. I was looking, it was 1997, and I was looking for a manual transmission. So I was looking all around. Yeah, they're, they're a little hard to find. Sure. Even then. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Were you looking for a Land Rover specifically, or did, is this like you're just looking for a manual? You wanted something you know, different, and, and that popped up, or? Was it you knew that you wanted a Land Rover? Definitely wanted a Land Rover. I, I had moved to Spain when I was a child with my mother, and I had seen Land Rovers there when I was eight, and I knew that that 
was the ultimate vehicle for an adventurer. And I definitely wanted one. Of course, then we're talking about series Land Rovers, and that's really what I fell in love with first. And when I those was would in have the been States, those would have been Santanas over there, right? You know, I think they were. Um, unfortunately, it was before my photo days, so I didn't really photograph any. But I believe they were mostly Santanas. Yeah, with the little safari, they had the safari roofs. I remember. Yep. Right. Yeah, yeah, those beautiful. are yeah, those are pretty. Uh, yeah, those are a ticket. Those safari roofs. Yeah. So, uh, so you did go out then looking for Defender, and you found one, and secondhand. Mm -hmm. And did you? Uh, did was there a journey to get it? Did you? It was there an adventure getting the vehicle itself. There usually is. That's why I ask. Right. It was a bit of an adventure. There was a a guy representing the the shop in New York, and he drove it up to uh, Southern Massachusetts, and we met at a a toll booth. <laughs> that's, Alrighty. that's how it worked that's an interesting place to meet well at least it didn't get the name the toll booth i guess that's, that's right yeah and, and you were buying it right then and there or was it like i'll just bring the vehicle to show you or had you already bought it uh, i had kind of put a down payment on it and then i purchased it did, did you pay the man with quarters <laughs> yes he was well, you pass. To get back through yes <laughs> So it was completely drivable? Yes, it was. And Did it was in great condition. It had 18,000 miles on it. Uh, wow. I think it was somebody's second vehicle. Uh -huh. it, was, it was beautiful. A low it's, mileage just, North American spec. When did you get that? Yeah. How long ago was that? This would, have been, uh, this would have been 1997, so 17 years ago. Wow. So you bought it when it was only two years old? Yes. Wow. That's yeah. that nice. And, that, and it's only gone up in value since then. And well, you know, it did go up in value for a while. Uh, I think at this point, I'm not sure. I think now it's what about thirteen or fifteen thousand that they go for. I'm not really sure. Mine has definitely no. been used. No, uh, sir. No, sir. You uh, look again, buddy. They go for more than that now. Uh, you can get a. Uh, there's only you know uh, what? What's the number again? Five hundred. Five hundred per year over four year span. So there's only two thousand North American spec nineties. And then there were 50 110s, right? Uh, 500 110s. 500 110s also. So there's a very limited number of North American spec versions here in the United States, and their value has only gone up. Uh, recently, I've seen them go for forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars 60000 Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yours? Uh... The, the 90s don't bring as much, mind you, because they have four times as many of them, but still, it's going to go for more than 15 you can get right. rusty, nasty ones for fifteen, and given that yours has been in Mexico, I don't think it's rusty. No, that's true. It's not. It did have some rust that I had to take out from the Massachusetts days and the salt uh, on okay. the roads, but down here it's so dry. But I'm never going to sell. It's really. <laughs> oh no, no, we weren't. We weren't saying that you should. I was. We were just uh, thinking about the price and the value. And well, although right. if you do sell it, we have dibs. <laughs> yes. You got it. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, yes, we would. Yes, the podcast has dibs on any defender that should be sold. I like. We hereby that. claim. We hereby dibs claim on every defender on the continent. <laughs> yeah, we will decide. We're have to make up our own flag. Oh, this That's is great. Right. It's a great idea. I believe so. <laughs> and I haven't even been drinking today. <laughs> Welcome to Defenderland. Uh, sorry, Sean. We got a little off track there. Uh, <laughs> All right, so you have a 97. Uh, 95. 95. I'm sorry, you got it in 97. So you have, a, you have a 95 D90, and you've had it for a number of years. That's, that's good. Uh, did you, have you done anything to it uh, besides general maintenance? I'm thinking, like, have you done anything for adventuring, off-roading, overlanding? Hmm. We, we keep it pretty stock. Uh, she does have slightly larger mud terrains, but nothing, nothing that big. I think they're 33s. Yeah, and uh, no. no, everything's stock. We have a Badger Coachworks top that is awesome. I was going to ask if it was hard or soft top, so you have soft top. That's true. Yes, I have a soft top. Um, but no, otherwise she's pretty stock. Maintenance, of course, is a bit of a challenge down here. We get most of our parts through the United States or directly from England, but we don't work so much with Land Rover Mexico. Hmm. They, don't, they do have defenders, but not everything applies to our defender. Well, the nice thing about about the ninety five is that it's uh, it looks a little more uh, like something they would understand down there, having a distributor and spark plug wires and all that sort of thing. Right. Well, that's true. It sounds like his experience is not much different than ours, because you know you take a, a Defender into a United States dealership and they look at you weird, so it's nothing. Well, there would be that. I yes. would, in fact, I wouldn't take one to a dealership no. unless I was 
you know, had a gun to my head. Well, I wouldn't either, but then again, <laughs> I don't have to. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> and oddly enough, though, we do get our parts from the United States and from England also. Um, so it's yeah, our, your experience is the same as ours, pretty much. Actually, right. the interesting thing is a lot of the, the V8 stuff is hard to get out of England. It's mm. easier to get locally here than it is to get out of England because that's considered a a special option over there. They didn't right. sell many many gasoline V8s over there, so the parts are not commonly stocked. Right, right. Hmm. So okay, so you 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 have a basically stock disco uh, disco. You have basically stock Defender, which is nice. Uh, that's that's all good. Uh, radio, uh, CB, anything uh, interesting? You know, I think I had some. Uh, High school kids in Massachusetts relieved me of the radio, and since it's a soft top in Mexico, I don't keep anything in it. In fact, we do the exact opposite. We have it. We don't have a cubby box. We don't have speakers. We don't have a stereo. We don't have a back seat. We don't have a tire rack. We keep everything really minimal because we have to be able to leave it as it is yeah. uh, when we are hiking or doing other things like that. So you keep it stripped down on purpose, right? So it's there when they return. <laughs> and even so, of course, we take good care of it. We, uh, we're installing a kill switch, and we do like to tuck it away and leave it uh, unexposed whenever possible. Yeah. But often we have to leave it a open. Hit, hidden kill switch is, a, is a, a, an easy, cheap upgrade to do. Cor of course, in this country, we don't need those because you have a manual transmission. That's the ultimate theft resistance here. <laughs> right. Now, here, anybody can drive it. My yeah. only uh, saving grace is that she's a little finicky. Car, car thieves here, for some reason, do not know how to drive manual transmission. And if you really want to go for the ultimate in theft-proofing, get yourself a right-hand drive manual transmission. <laughs> yeah, it throws people off. Uh, particularly a series truck. So you have four sticks coming up out of the floor. That's right. It really messes with their minds. <laughs> yeah, and you just put the transfer case in neutral, and you're good. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought yeah, about that. That's another that's good, true. good thing to do. Yeah, yeah. So what, why is it finicky? Um... Recently, well, we've, we're just resolving a problem with the front prop shaft. We got it from GBR Performance in Salt Lake City. Yep. We Good lost people. the U-joint, and it damaged the front prop. It damaged the, the sleeve yoke, and so we had to replace the front prop shaft. But we're also having, I think, some issues, or at least we were, with the fuel injection. It's possible that that's mostly resolved. We just recently cleaned the fuel lines. Mm -hmm. And we're able to get it run to run a little smoother, but uh, we had some issues there, and we had the prop shaft, things like that. But uh, she's running pretty well, considering we don't have. Well, it's hard to it's a little harder to maintain the Land Rover down here sometimes, getting parts. Do you do it yourself, or are you are you do you work on your own vehicle, or do you have to you know find a local garage? I do a little bit of both. It depends on what we're talking about, but I do all the research. Uh, and if need be, I'll rely on a on a mechanic around here. Right. There are a lot of good good resources online for the research to to know what to do. Yeah. Right. Well, I, when I had this front prop shaft issue, the U joint situation, we were in the middle of nowhere, and we had hoped to remove the front prop shaft and just continue on with the rear prop shaft, but that doesn't work, and we had to figure out why. And I think it was on D ninety source that they were explaining that that just wouldn't work. You have to lock the center diff, and then you should be fine. Right. But we were trying to cover. Many a couple hundred miles yeah. on the highway, so we didn't do that. It should still work with the diff locked. Yeah, it worked, but we weren't sure about driving on on the highway with it. It should be okay. Cool. So, so did you have to go to GBR for a replacement shaft, or did you just go with something different? Uh, I went with GBR to, re to replace the front prop shaft. Okay. Turned out to be really relatively inexpensive, uh, two hundred bucks, which. Considering what I was seeing online for the front prop shaft of the NAS Defender, I'm pretty, pretty happy about that. They're good people the, there. The piece They're... looks, yeah, the, the piece looks fantastic. I'm pretty excited about it. We haven't put it in yet, but uh, we're going to do that this week. Yeah, that that, uh, that that outfit is run by a guy named Bill Davis. He's originally from Pittsburgh. Oh, I did not know that. Cool. He's, he's one of ours. Yeah, I spoke with Bill. He's he was very helpful. Yeah, he's a good guy. <laughs> Cool. So you okay? So you you do your own your own maintenance. And so, what do you do with the Defender? Uh, you're a photographer. Can you give us a little more about uh, you know? Do you use it for work? It sounds like, and also, and and I guess for leisure and fun and adventure. 
for everything, sure. I came down to Mexico seven years ago. So did my partner, Mitty. Uh, she's a writer. I'm a freelance photographer. Mostly documentary photography is my thing, but we also do a lot of travel, and I, I do a lot of commercial work, too, basically to fuel the travel. We're interested in traveling all over Mexico um, and further south, and we write articles, we take photos, and we try to just keep the adventure going with what we can make from that, if that makes sense. Well, it seems to me if she's a writer and you're a photographer, you've kind of got the whole package right there. <laughs> yes. Right. It's working out pretty well. You know, we've produced a few articles for Jeff with Rovers Magazine, and we have one coming out with Landover Monthly. And uh, it's, it's, it's working well. We're hoping that we can use publications in part to get us a little further south. It's all about fundraising at this point and getting the rover ready to sleep in it. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, oh, go ahead. We're going to put some grills on the outside for protection, um, A, for when we sleep, but also for the the things that we might like to leave behind, like some camping gear. On a longer trip, which I think would probably be about three or four months, we'll have a, a little bit more gear, so we'll have to find ways to secure it. Currently working on that stuff. Sure, sure. So you, you said you're going south, and uh, I know we talked a little bit before the podcast, and I think you, you're headed to South America. Can you tell us some more about, about that and what you're going to do and how, how that's taking shape? Yeah, we're interested in running pretty much the Pan American Highway, and we're going to get off at a whole bunch on the way down. But we want to travel down to uh, probably Costa Rica, where we'll catch the ferry to cross the Darien Gap. We will not be crossing the Darien Gap with the vehicle. Uh, I, I think it's passable. I don't think it's safe. I think they have a lot of security issues there. So we're going to go around that part, and it'll probably dump, dump us either in Colombia or Ecuador. And from there, we... Really, we want to meet with Land Rover groups. We want to get into the nooks and crannies, see the indigenous peoples, and just really experience Latin America. You know, we live in a place with such cultural richness that it would be, it's kind of a shame not to. Have you had a chat with Graham and Louisa yet? Graham, are you talking about in Belize? Uh, no, Graham and Louisa Bell. They're the, the family that's doing the A to A expedition. Oh, yes. Thank you. I don't know them personally, but I have spoken to them, and they passed through. Unfortunately, we missed them. I think they're already in Alaska, aren't they? Uh, I believe they're in Washington getting ready yeah. to cross over right. into Canada. To yeah. Head, they're heading to Alaska, yes. You, uh, yeah, I would uh, highly re They've been on the podcast, and I'd highly recommend their, uh, their book. It uh, talks about some of the things that, you're, that you have uh, referenced about crossing the Daring Gap and getting all around yeah. uh, Brazil. They, they'd be a good resource. And also they are a yeah. good resource. In fact, they've already been very helpful. Uh, I good. think we're going to connect with some Land Rover clubs further south through them, so that'll be helpful too. Of course, one of the things we'll be doing is finding places to camp for free, uh, maybe the occasional shower, so those, those <laughs> contacts help. Yeah, as I understand it, they're masters at that particular skill. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, they stated a lot of... Uh, uh, truck stops and gas stations and you know they, they would they've they would, wrangled into yeah. a few house sitting jobs along the way too they did they had some people take them in and they've had some house sitting jobs and they, yeah they've uh, they did pretty well they've done pretty well yeah, but <laughs> but buy their book so that helps them out too so you know, absolutely yeah. <laughs> and then make your own book apparently that's the format that would yeah nothing wrong with that yeah a good book that'd be good you got a writer and a photographer done there deal that's it put out a kindle edition four bucks a pop maybe a little more you'd be all right Absolutely. I think as freelancers, it's key for us to have various um, sources of income. So having a book online like that would certainly help our cause. Oh, absolutely. And a, a, there was a travel funding site that just closed down. Tra Travolta? Is that the name of it? But it was kind of a similar, like a GoFundMe or, you know, for... In fact, you could even use GoFundMe, too. That's another thing to consider. Uh, there's a way to do that. And, oh, you know, and there's an, a, another site you, which may be more your speed and you could... Uh, you utilize it better called Patreon. And in fact, I'm considering that for our podcast as a way to help fund a little bit of what we do. And you can, um, and it's basically, it goes along the word with Patreon. It's like you can become a patron. So if you, like in a podcast world, you put out a monthly episode, you could have folks contribute and subscribe and give, you know, a dollar, five dollars, ten bucks an episode. And then you could do something along the same lines, potentially, uh, Sean, with the way you're, you know, maybe putting out an article and with pictures and, all sorts of kind of interesting things you could do there. Something to look at. 
Excellent. Thank you. Patreon. Patreon. P A T R E O N. Right. P Patreon. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Patreon. Yeah. So I've been I've been looking at it on and off for the past couple months. It's want to make it work, and I've, I have some ideas and to make it work. Um, plus, and you know, just busy during the summer. But I think maybe in the next month or two, I might put put ours up. And uh, Ben Ben from uh, Fun Rover just put one up for his uh, right. podcast or right. his video efforts. Uh, so that's out there and. Anyway, something to look at. That's cool. So you're going. You want to go south into South America, and you th and you think this is going to be a three or four month journey? Probably so. Yeah. yeah, we're not entirely sure, but it'll depend on fundraising and how, basically, how much time we can afford to feed ourselves and put gasoline in the in the Land Rover. Yeah, we have a. We'll probably rent our little place out here, so we'll have that money coming in. But we'll also have to to raise a whole bunch before we leave. Well, you folks have have uh, you know you do work now. Can you take any of that with you? Yeah, sure. I mean, we'll be working hard up until we leave, and on the road, we'll also be trying to get as many jobs as we can. Um, so yeah, we'll be doing a little bit of everything. I, I would but, think yeah. your skills are portable. I would think you could sort of work your way down the continent. Sure, I think so too. Um, you know, writing ahead and sending my portfolio that that will work to some degree. I think. It'll be yes, one one source of income as we do it. Hopefully, it's not always necessarily about having one really good source. If you have a bunch of little things that, that trickle yeah. in fast enough, right, right, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I had a question, then it went out of my head. That's what happens. Whoops. Yeah, it does. That does happen. Um, all right, so you're headed uh, for three or four months into South America. What? How much do you expect to cover? Like, are you thinking? From just from reading Graham's book, uh, it seems like that's not a lot of time. <laughs> they were in no particular hurry, mind you. No, but it still seems like you know three or four months. Maybe you might be able to do Brazil. You know, it's just, again, it depends on how thoroughly you want to do it. I suppose. Right. We certainly want to do it thoroughly, and we'll probably be resting up to have, uh, say, money from the house, which will be coming in as rent reach us so we'll be taking our time three or four months may be um too short of a time but we're hoping to be around there maybe four to six then but someplace around then we are going to get off uh, the beaten path as much as possible so it could take quite a while yeah yeah it could yeah, interesting so and uh, what kind of uh, uh output that's because i can't think of anything better right now just uh, expect like are you gonna are you, do you plan to have uh, articles come out you're having a blog or uh, you know a web a, a facebook site or something well we'll use a facebook site but we just started a url which is sean and midi dot com and we'll be putting our our rover landing stuff there um that's um uh, we are going to produce some articles on the road. It's, that'll be new. Up until now, we've taken trips, we've returned, we've sent the articles in for publishing and payment. But I think since we are going to be hoping for another source of income on the road, we'll be pausing to submit. I'll be editing on the road. We'll both will be editing on the road, and we'll probably submit on the way if we can. We'll have to get an agreement with some of the publications to make sure that they will want this material <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i think so good idea but, well uh, that's maybe where the patreon could help you out too getting them to own. want it i don't think is the problem getting them to want to pay for it is maybe another story no, true true <laughs> well you know we have had some success in that department um we are selling some of these land rover articles of course not always but uh that is that's part of the plan good for you well you have uh, you have experience you have some history to it and uh, you have a nice story because uh, you know you and the then the vehicle has a cool name and it came up in in, in a cool way so you've got some uh, you got some uh, charisma around it right <laughs> yes i hope so <laughs> we're, we're pretty excited yeah you should be i, I it sounds it sounds fascinating just to, you know we through the podcast and meeting some people we have i know overlandings become more interesting to me than it ever had been and think that i thought in my life and so hearing you know Graham and Louisa coming from South South Africa and going through South America and coming up into here it's just a, it's interesting and then you know there's a, a what impresses me about them is that they just have no real plan for when this is going to end they're just they're just living the dream they're just doing it true true and then, and for yeah. however long they want to which is really cool and yeah then, with two younger children right uh, yes not, uh, not so young anymore actually. No. Not so young. 
Yeah, I think uh, his his boy is uh, 16 or 15, 16. He just turned 16. And then the, his uh, youngest daughter is 9, maybe Something 10. Something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. so the boy is learning to drive while yes, on is. this venture. While on the drive. Yeah. Then there's the, an amazing experience. Oh, I, wouldn't, wouldn't it be? That'd just be tremendous. Yeah, absolutely tremendous just to, to grow up in that in, in that kind of uh, world, if you will. Mm-hmm. There's the and there's the Lizzie bus. I don't know if you've heard of them. That's a oh absolutely. So you know, they've gone around the world once. Now they're going to go into Siberia and um, that you know so six continents, sixty six countries, one hundred thirty three thousand miles. Yes, they're an inspiration. They're amazing, and they just got the Lizzie bus fixed up, right, to go into just, Russia. They just redid the truck, and they're going to go do it again. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, yes. And then the. Um, is it the day trippers that are now? They are in Kazakhstan. They're from Brazil. They're in a one ten. Are you familiar with them? Oh, no, that's new. I haven't heard of that. Yeah, they're pretty amazing. I will send you guys the link. Yeah. Um, pretty sure they're the day trippers, and they just went through Kazakhstan in a, in a navy blue one ten. They've been. They came through here like maybe two years ago. Wow. Yeah. That's neat. Yeah, stuff. pretty cool. I'm I'm fishing for a Borat reference, but I'm 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 not coming up with it. I'm not a I'm not a Borat guy. Sorry. Well, you you know, know. Kazakhstan Borat. It's yeah, yeah. Okay. Enough said. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Insert your own joke here. Right. Yeah. yeah. There you go. We'll, we'll leave a blank spot. So you've always been a Land Rover guy, Sean? Yeah, pretty much since about eight. And that was that was from watching all the the old uh, safari videos and movies and uh, videos. That's that's a there's a new word. Uh, I use from uh, so, and uh, have you own, owned any other Land Rovers? No, in fact, I've never owned another vehicle. I've Whoa! Only had this one. Yeah, I think uh, as a child, I always wanted to be an adventurer. That was, you know, a discoverer, an adventurer, and so the Land Rover was the obvious choice. And when I got to the states, I was looking for the the series, but the Defender had finally come out over there, so it was a possibility. So this is the only vehicle you have ever owned. That's correct. Yeah, I used to do my daily commute in it. Damn. When I had a daily commute. Harold is actually jealous, I think. No, I'm uh, just stunned. <laughs> uh, the concept of only owning one vehicle is, is kind of foreign to me. <laughs> I have no frame of reference. <laughs> to different worlds. Definitely different worlds. Her- I think uh, Harold owned one. Uh, his first, but he owned his first vehicle when he was what, fifteen? I know I was sixteen. Sixteen. But, yeah. But I mean, I only owned one vehicle for a very short period of time. Yeah. 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 It's like potato chips. You can't have just one. <laughs> it's true. So, uh, just uh, from from the the Poderosa video and and your website, you were not always a photographer. And can we ask what you used to do and and how that uh, got you to where you are now? Right. Well, I had gone to school for foreign policy, and I had worked in Boston and Washington D.C. and in the area of U.S. Latin American relations. I was working. Well, Harvard has a Center for Latin American Studies. I was with the Inter-American Development Bank. And the last thing I was doing was working with organizations interested in immigration policy. But it was right around there that I just, I needed a break. I needed to get out. I was feeling that I wasn't in the action. I was always interested in Latin America. I'd been traveling and taking photographs since I was a child. But I was spending most of my time uh, behind a desk doing research on the East Coast which was cool, but it wasn't as fulfilling. So coming down here, I really was going to relocate to the United States. I was taking Texas or California by the border. Um, But leaving the United States, I realized that I wasn't really interested in going back, but rather I wanted to keep the adventure going. So how do you do that? You know, then, so you've been a photographer, an amateur for 15, 20 years, then you take that and you try to make a, a living out of it. And, that's kind of where I've been for, say, the last five or six years. But it's it's panned out. Now the freelance photographer business is established, so I have uh, enough clients to keep going. And the nice thing is you have that, that background in, in the Latin American and, and the international relations that allows you to have the life down there. Right. And, and I speak it's... Spanish. That helps. Yeah, we're we're very interested in the the Central American migrants that come through here, and we write about that and we photograph them. Um, so yeah, you're right. My background is relevant to what I'm doing down here. 
I would say my parents don't agree with that, but. <laughs> uh oh. Parents don't often agree or don't always agree with the choices we make in life, and that's okay. Yeah. Right. Do they come visit you? Um, no, but actually, my mother doesn't live too, too far away. She lives in Mexico. Um, oh. So, but she's, she just believes that uh, I should get back on the path. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can understand like that. Like, get a real job get kind a real, of thing? Yes. Son, get a real job. <laughs> yes. And, yes. And there's, and there's probably that uh, there's probably the other thing, too. Hey, where's the grandkids? <laughs> That's usually, that usually follows up. You know, one, one follows the other. Yeah. Get a real job. We need grandkids, you know. Well, they need someone to spoil. Little do they know, his defender is his grandchild. There you go. She right? Just Can't they to... just spoil my Land Rover? Ex yes, exactly. So I've been trying to convince people my own self. <laughs> yeah, who needs kids? Well, we we certainly can't afford kids right now. Yeah, well. especially not. Uh, we you know it's going to be a fair amount of effort just to get the rover up to speed for the longer trip because we do have a fair amount of maintenance before then. Right. Well, so what uh, what things do you want to do to the truck? You said I know you want to get it ready for uh, sleeping and for a little more safety. So are you going to put a hard top on it? Uh, have you thought about maybe using a one ten instead? But then again, of course, that would defeat the purpose of you only ever owning one vehicle your entire life. Right? No, no. This is about <laughs> doing it with almost no money, John. I have to. Um, I don't know if I can. I don't. I don't know if you've seen it, but I have a grill on the front of, front of my. Defender that is made in a by a, a metal worker with materials from a hardware store. I'm going to use that stuff to basically cage in the back of the rover. And as far as sleeping goes, it's going to be a wood platform on a metal on some metal braces that'll essentially cover the entire back. I think mm -hmm. the passenger seat will have to fold down as much as it does, and we'll have our feet go that way. It's not going to be ideal, but when we're not doing that, we'll be camping and staying wherever else we can. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, we have to do it with what we have. You know, we really, we're freelance writer and photographer. We don't have many resources to put toward this. If we can save the gas money and the money to feed ourselves, I think we'll be in good shape. So, so you're going to construct something akin to a shark cage on wheels. That's right. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting approach. Yeah. Well, it fits. It fits. You know, that's and, if the, it, and if it suits your needs, then, then go for it. Yeah, we do have to keep things simple. We, if we're going to be traveling as much as we'd like to, we really have to keep costs down. Right. Have you ever thought about maybe a platform on the roof for sleeping? Yes, I have thought about that. Um, You'd have more length, more room, I think. That is true. Then we'd have to cover it. But yes, well, you're some, right. Some boards or something would be okay. Thanks, Harold. I'm, I'm going to give that some thought. Actually, that's not a bad idea. You could throw a roof rack up there. You wouldn't. You wouldn't even need to put anything above the, on the top. I'm thinking if he's building his cage, if he uses a little bit heavier metal and makes it strong enough, oh. he could just lay some boards up top, some planking, some pla and sleep right. on that. Oh, and that's a low money solution. That is a low money solution, also. And yeah, you'd have the extra length being able to go all the way to the windscreen. Right. Right. Oh, I was thinking you were you were thinking of going the, the fuller way of having putting a tent up there and. You know, having the, exp you know, the well, that's great if you have the money. Exp expedition tent, right? Yeah, tents are cool, but uh, oh, on the other hand, right. sure. I think down there you could sleep under the stars, and it would be a lot of fun being right. up off the ground. I don't think you have lions to worry about. No, but if we had the right sponsor for a rooftop tent, that would be awesome. We will probably have some inclement weather. We have to plan the trip so that we don't uh, say hit Central America in the rainy season or the tip of Argentina in winter. So we'll have to see how that plays out. But we'll yeah. definitely get some rain. Yeah. And you're gonna are you and you're gonna keep the vehicle open? Well, he has, well, a, he has a soft top. Yeah, I do. I have a Badger Coach where it's, it's actually a Coach Coach Works. Excuse me, it's a full top, but it no longer has the sides. It's ten years old, mm. so it's a, a Surrey top at this point. Uh, yeah. So that could be interesting when the rain starts coming in sideways. Right. Well, yeah, we're thinking about all kinds of creative solutions. We might even put our own sides on it this time. We'll see. Find, find some local w that's handy with a sewing machine? Perhaps. Or maybe uh, Chris at Badger Coachworks will uh, consider helping us out a little bit. That's right. Sponsorship is always a good thing. <laughs> and right. If, and we'll be doing that too. Yeah. If you, and if you put uh, sides on it, uh, you're going to need a rear, also a rear cover because uh, 
least with my 109, I know the way the wind rolls. Uh, once I put sides down, all the stuff gets kicked up in the back and rolls up and then comes back into the cabin from the rear. Yep. So true. Yeah. So I have to just something to think about. Yeah, as it's not just two sides. You have to get around the back too. You do get. Yeah, you do have three. Yeah. Yeah. Just something to think about. Hmm. Sorry, I'm thinking about all those things as we're talking and. Yeah, this is good. This is very helpful, actually. The uh, the rooftop idea is something to be considered. Yeah, it's actually not a bad idea. You could even throw a tent up there if you had to. It, you know, just to that's true. Just make sure you, you as long as you're not a, a sleeper who rolls around a lot, so. <laughs> and roll off the side. Yeah, that, yeah. Would, that ah! would suck. <laughs> All right, so uh, minimal modifications. You're going to head uh, t- uh, three, four months or so until uh, the money runs out, it sounds like, um, and uh, head to South uh, Well, that's kind of like life, really. Just You'll do whatever you need to do until the money runs out. And mm-hmm. um, uh, so, a- Any other th- uh, ideas like beyond that? Is uh, anything special you want to do? I know you want to go off the beaten path in South America. Is there anything spe- special you want to see, anything where you want to go? Something that you have to check out on your on your list of things. There are several archaeological sites in southern Mexico and Central America that we'll want to check out. When we get over into South America, we have the salt flats of Bolivia. We have the Atacama Desert. Uh, we definitely want to see the Amazon. We'll probably do so a little bit more from the west rather than head over to the east into Brazil. And uh, I think every step of the way is going to be pretty gorgeous. Uh, and what about uh, other cultural amenities like food and drink? We'll be exploring all of the cuisines. We'll be <laughs> eating some pretty risky stuff, no doubt. But we do that here anyway in Mexico. We we eat everything. We eat the street food. We eat everything that everybody else here eats just to get a sense of it. And it's usually pretty good. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I like, I'm a, as you may notice, because I know you can see me on Skype, I enjoy food myself. <laughs> we do occasionally run into trouble with uh, our stomachs. You know, we we were in Cuba for a month, for example, and, and we both had typhoid, which was a, a very difficult thing to, to get through. But it was, you know, that's the kind of thing that happens to us on these journeys. Now, you mentioned going to some archaeological sites. Uh, by chance, would one of those be the Ruta Maya? The Ruta Maya? You mean the one... The the Land River Camel Trophy? Uh, yeah, there's a, a Rutamaya site there that they actually made replicas of some of the statues and hauled them in by discovery. That's very cool. Um, we passed by part of that route when we were in Guatemala last time, which is why I think Jeff called the Guatemala model, excuse me the Guatemala article Rutamaya 14. But um, we probably will. I'm going to have to do some research. Yeah, somewhere in my, my archives of stuff, I have a video uh, that was produced of, of that, that journey, and it was pretty interesting. That was one of the Camel Trophy? It, w- it wasn't Camel Trophy. Oh. It was, a, it was a, a, just a, a bunch of archaeologists who, who I think they were maybe not sponsored by, by Land Rover, but hmm. it was a, a fleet of discoveries, and they, they, t- they made these replicas of the, of the statues, and they strapped them to the roof rack and, and then drove them through the jungle to the, to the site. Oh, neat. That's cool. But, you know, I'm sorry. I was confused. It is. It was Mundo Maya, which I think was the camel that, expedition. That, that, that could be. That came through, and that's, that was also the name of the article. But you're saying Ruta Maya, yeah. and I don't know. I'm going to check that out. You should, you should check that out because that's right, right up your, uh, your alley. Yeah. Absolutely. Neat. Very cool. Thank you. What other interesting Land Rover things have occurred in South America that uh, – there was a camel trophy or two. I'm not up on my. Uh... Besides the camel trophy and the the infamous Darien Gap crossing, um, right? Uh, I'm yeah. not sure what else. Yeah. Hmm. Not much since then. Didn't they have the? Was the G? The G four. I think they. I think they tried to hit all the continents, but I, I think there was some G four activity yeah. there. But I really haven't followed that as closely as the, no. the camel. And the G4 mainly was less about off-roading than it was about the kind of adventuring and getting there in, right. in the truck. Uh, it, it seemed to me that it kind of paled in comparison to the, the yeah. legendary Camel Trophy. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, that was more about the uh, lifestyle, I think. And that's probably a better way to put that. Yeah. Lifestyle adventuring. Yeah. Well, although, that's kind of what Sean and his partner's doing. I forgot her name. I'm sorry. 
Mitty, Mitty Roger. Mitty, Mitty, thank you. Mitty, yep. M I T T? T T I E. M I T T E, Mitty. Hello, Mitty. <laughs> I'm afraid she's not here right now. <laughs> that's, that's okay. <laughs> is, is that name from a uh, uh, Cajun influence? Uh, her last name, yes. And Mitty is a family name. Okay, interesting. And you're both from, are you both from Louisiana? We're both from Louisiana and we met down here. Oh, uh, neat. Yeah. You, you met we're, down we're pretty there. pretty happy. You met in Mexico. Yes, we did. Even though you're both from, that's interesting. Yeah. Small it world, eh? Very fortunate finding each other here. That's very cool. That's very cool. Uh, so, and, you, and we had talked earlier, so you're from Louisiana originally and then you've moved around a little bit. You were in Spain, you were in uh, Massachusetts and D.C. That's right. Exactly. Pretty much in that order. And uh, I was finishing up in Washington, D.C. when I came down here to San Miguel. And did you have any problems uh, crossing the border with your with your uh, defender? No, no trouble. Oh, I do have to keep it constantly updated. I still have American plates. I don't know if you guys know that South Dakota allows you to have plates even if you're a non-resident. So I have plates from there on my defender down here, which means I have to bring it out of the country uh, every so often. Right now I have a, a residency, so it's good probably for four years as long as I keep renewing it, but eventually I have to bring it in and out uh, to renew the importation sticker on it. Hmm. So when that time just comes... Just to keep it updated. When the time comes, you just have to take a road trip up to the States and maybe come see us, and then that, that, cl <laughs> that clears the slate for you. That's right. It takes about 10 hours to reach the border from here, and sometimes uh, the last time we did it or the time before that, we did it through uh, the Chiapas-Guatemala border and then came in through Belize, Mexico. And it's pretty fine. You know, American plates, American passports, not too much trouble at the borders. That's good. That's good to hear. And, and the truck is North American spec and has the sticker to prove it, so there's no question with, with that side of things, since that's a, a big issue now with defenders. That's especially coming into the U.S., yeah. Yes. Exactly. It's much right. easier we to take them out than it is to bring them in. Mm -hmm. And we keep our inspection sticker up to date and everything like that. So, But it's, it's cool. We just have to be informed. It's like being a, an expat. There are so many rules that apply to your residency, your taxes, everything else that you have to learn how to manage. It's a consideration, but it's not, it's not too big of a problem. Do you have any problems importing the vehicle in New Mexico? Do they have the same issues that the U.S. has, or same restrictions, excuse me, that the U.S. has with the safety and emissions? Uh, no, not for temporary importation. Since I'm not nationalizing the vehicle, um, I don't really have to worry about emission standards, although I do keep my sticker current just to stay out of trouble. But since the big, tr the big thing would be nationalizing. And since I'm essentially bringing it in on a sticker that lasts six months, unless you have a residency card, in which case it lasts the length of the residency, which in this case will probably be about four years. Uh, I'm, I'm okay. okay. As long as I have that sticker and, I'm in pretty much good shape. I have to worry about it. So that sounds a lot like the, the temporary short-term exemptions that non-citizens get for bringing things in, in here to the U.S. As a, you're, an, you're being a, That you're, sounds correct. You're a non-Mexican citizen, so they give you temporary permission to bring whatever you have, pretty much. Exactly. As long as my papers are up to date, the vehicle is protected. As long as it's legal in the, in the country it's coming from. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Right. Yeah. I did once have an issue in which the vehicle could not be taken out as its papers were expiring, and I had to get a special document that was called a, a safe return that allowed me to just make a drive for the border. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> uh, that's too funny. <laughs> uh, yes. Permission to flee. Yes. Granted. Yes. Go. Go. <laughs> yes. Do you, have, do you have any problems at the border in the United States getting back in? They look at you weird, funny. I just, I'm just curious to see how, what, what that border crossing is like. Yeah, the we've actually had nothing major, but we've had some difficulties at the U.S. border, more so than at other borders, but uh, just because they're very thorough. 
they do question we come in using different vehicles different times the last time we went up we were actually driving a mini cooper to san antonio to be sold because uh well some friends were in the same boat we are in in which they had a non-nafta vehicle that cannot be nationalized that's essentially why my land rover cannot be nationalized uh, in mexico it's already been re it's already been imported to the united states once so they don't do that uh, that car had to leave and when it left when we were at the border they noted that we were not in our usual car and they wanted to know about the Defender. But usually the Defender is not a problem because it has both of our logos on it and it seems all pretty much above board and they can check it out in a matter of minutes, you know? Right. Yeah. But they do. They check things out. We also have been stopped in the southern border. That whole stretch of Mexico that runs along the Guatemalan border is a little... Um, a little intense security wise there are a lot of drugs that move through there so they patrol a lot a lot of military checkpoints and there we have we've been out of the vehicle they've taken parts off of it and we've had dogs but no problems really I mean, as long as our papers are in order which they usually are we're in good shape well, that's good to hear i i've crossed the canadian border but i've uh, not had to cross the mexican border yeah it's it's an experience and so is central america those borders are pretty chaotic that's a is that a nice word for disorganized and concerning? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, because they have they have a different setup. You know, in the no man's zone, the no man's land between the borders, there are often people that want to help you with your papers, and there might be a bunch of them, and they might be pounding on the glass, that kind of thing. So it's it's different. It's a whole different experience. Wow. Yeah, that's that would be different. Uh, intense is a good word. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. So beyond uh, visiting South uh, America, uh, is there other plans down the road years from now? Do you have, uh, I don't know, go to other continents or some maybe a, a deep dive into a, a specific culture in South America? Well, I think ultimately we'll want to live elsewhere further south. But I think after the trip to Argentina, if it goes well, we want to just essentially keep going. We want to go up to Alaska and continue the adventure. If at all possible, and I haven't looked into this yet, but if there's a ferry across from Alaska to Russia, mm. we, we would love to continue the dream. Absolutely. I mean, it'll, it'll depend on funding. I believe there's one proposed, but I don't think there ever was one up into place. Yet. Yeah. yeah. I heard there was a, even talk of a, a bridge. Have you heard of this? Yeah, there was a couple. I think within the past year or two, there was, I think, a Russian who was talking about a bridge. But I can't imagine that that's... It's oh, not a great distance. No, it's what, 180 miles, I think? Well, Is it, that the closest? Well, it depends. I mean, if you can island hop, it's, uh, it's actually a lot shorter. Is it? Okay. So you would have to do a series of bridges, probably. Yeah. yeah. Might be further away politically, though, huh? Oh, I definitely think so. Not, not maybe as far as it once was, but still probably too far to make a bridge happen. Uh, that, there's uh, some conversation that the Cold War has uh, restarted again, That's, mm -hmm. especially yeah. within the past uh, two years or so. Yeah, and, I, could, you know, I could see that to a certain extent. Yeah, but uh, I think actually the other, uh, you may not have noticed, but the atomic clock that they had has been has ticked closer. The, the doomsday clock? Doomsday clock, thank yeah. you, has ticked closer instead of further away from midnight. Uh, haven't so. checked it recently. Exactly. Yes, but uh, things have changed. Yeah. So, but why is everybody going to Alaska? This is my question. Because it's cool. Literally cool. One of the last great wildernesses, right? Well, in winter it is. I suppose. I suppose it's the last great wilderness. Well, I guess Siberia and and stuff to go to Siberia now. It's it is sort of the final frontier, if you will, in this country at least. Yeah. Well, there's mm -hmm. the Amazon. You got Africa. I said Af in this country. Okay. All right. That's true. That's true. Well, there's a lot of Canada. A lot of Canada is, uh, is un, not even roaded. You know, there's, there's no. You have to cross that to get to Alaska. So mm -hmm. you see, so you see that as a bonus. That's true. You get to you get to into British Columbia, leaping from tree to tree, or or the Yukon, maybe depending on which way you go. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I'm just curious what the I, I, the, I looked when uh, when Dan was going to Alaska and he's just thinking about that. All, and then I had well, he goes because his job is there, and, and we've had a presence there for a long time, perhaps because of our proximity to Russia. Oh, definitely. But uh, but at the same time, though, I had uh, I had like three or four friends, people I knew in Pittsburgh. All of a sudden, like we're going to Alaska, and like independent, they like they know each other, and they're like why is everybody going to Alaska? Just that's why I asked the question. Seems like everybody's going to Alaska. Uh, it all seems of a like there's a, been a, a, a 
major flux in the past few years of, mm -hmm. of cable TV shows that, that show things in yeah. Alaska. That could be it. Well, it could be the wilderness. It could be the adventuring. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. Which, which Sean so. is out doing. John's taking some of the adventuring for us, those of us who can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's uh, So what is your favorite part of the adventuring, Sean? Is it the... Uh, you know, uh, I, I realize you're a photographer, so that's probably your favorite part. But let's maybe let's go with the next favorite part. Well, actually, I think my favorite part is the freedom. Uh, the reason I'm down here doing this is because I love to have control of my life and to explore. My days are my own, and I spend them, as you say, doing things I love, which is photography, traveling with MIDI, my Defender. It's it's really everything I would want to do. I officially hate you now. Uh, uh, this is a jealous hate. Uh, just to be clear, uh, you're doing what you want, how you want, when you want. <sighs> well, it's it's tricky. I have to say, you know, we have it's. You give up a lot to do this. Also, you know, I used to have a, a paycheck. I had health care. I had stability. You know, my mother had hope of grandchildren. Those kind of things have to be put on hold. And as a freelancer, you know, sometimes sometimes you make money and sometimes you don't. So there's a lot of instability in it, if that makes sense. Yeah, but but uh, sure, I am. I do feel like I'm living my dream. I had to to really make it happen, though. But going back to what you said earlier, anybody can do this, John. You can do this too. I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about it more and more now that we've been talking to all all well, of you. You make an interesting point, though. As an American in Mexico, what do you do for healthcare? Well, uh, with my residency papers, I am permitted to sign up for popular health care. Now, obviously, that's not the end-all, be-all. It might not be the solution to everything, but it is a good, good protection to some degree. I also... Is, that, know, Me is that Mexico's national health care? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. And we have good doctors down here. And the other thing about our doctors is they're not terribly expensive. Uh, we don't have... I mean, if I can go to the dentist and I can get my teeth cleaned for $40 and have it be a really excellent job, you know, somebody trained in the United States even, but the overhead is lower, the costs are lower, right. we can do it. But sure, things like that, healthcare, we are working on that, and that has to do with um, just making sure that we're residents and that we're signed up. Hmm. We actually had an incident uh, last year in which I was, we were crossing a border and we realized that our registration on the vehicle had expired. And that was an issue. They, it wasn't an issue getting out of Mexico. It was an issue getting into Guatemala. Mm. But it did ultimately work out. But those kind of things, absolutely, you have to really stay on top of. Where will we be able to find all of this information that you're going to put out? I know you mentioned earlier you're going to have a website. Is that coming soon? Is that something we can share with our audience now or maybe down the road? Sure. We have something up. We just threw it up last night. But it really is we're consolidating the rover adventure material from my website and from MIDI's website, and it'll be on seanandmidi.com. That's S-E-A-N-A-N-D-M-I-T-T-I-E.com. And we'll be putting our stuff there, but also it'll be coming out uh, hopefully in Landover magazines. You know, we have this uh, desert adventure. We just went to a town, a former ghost town called Real de Catorce, and uh, wrote about it for Landover Monthly, and that'll be. We'll be doing a lot of Mexico stuff before we head further south. So yeah, we'll be putting it all in Sean and Midi dot com. Sean, good. We'll uh, yeah, we'll get that up on the show notes also, so people can uh, can can go and see that. And thank you. Yeah, oh, please absolutely. follow us. Oh, absolutely. Check it, guys. Yeah, speaking of following, so what about the social medias? Uh, do you are you on the Twitters, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, the yeah, Mitty, I do Facebook, but Mitty does everything. I think she's on all the platforms, and uh, we put out a lot of content. And she does it on the road through, I think, Instagram and things like that. She puts up kind of a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff as we go. And all those connections will be available from your website? That's right. And what I can do is I can just make sure that I send it to you, too. Yes, yeah, please do that. Yeah, we'll please put a link it. on the show notes. I did, I did wish you happy birthday, by the way, from the Center Street podcast. So I, uh, on your, Thank on your, you very your Twitter, much. Yeah, and, hap, and, and happy birthday. It was Sean's birthday last week. So he, he turned 25, right? <laughs> Close to 40. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're still a kid to us. Yeah, yeah. I, know, yeah. I feel like a kid. I feel like a kid. Good for you. Living that's, the dream. That's, that is good. That is good. I, it, yeah, you are. It's, uh, it, sounds like a, it sounds like a fun time, good experience, and... 
and you're you know, being a, having a photographer and a, uh, and a and a writer in the uh, in, in the in the couple there that should uh, help to communicate that information out to everybody and, and the dream you're living. Yeah, thank you. It's coming together, and we're really excited. Uh, this last year, we've we've felt a lot of momentum. Have you gotten inspiration from others? And it, like, I know you know Graham and Louisa. Certainly, lately, you've you talked to them. But like before that, when you were thinking about moving and and changing your life, did you get inspiration from? Uh, others or you know a book or you know an article a, a you photograph know, i wasn't as aware of overlanding at the time but yes i did have a lot of people a lot of influences in my life that encouraged me to travel and get abroad and i think the inspiration was finally coming over here and just seeing if I could start a business and survive. And once that happened, I just felt so free. I'll just keep doing it, see where I can go. Um, yeah, it's been inspiring, but I definitely do tap into people just like that. And Lizzie Bus as well. Those people, there are other people in, in Russia, I think Sirocco. Anyway, amazing stuff. And people are reaching such remote corners right now it's it's a good time to be doing this it's exciting it certainly is yeah you're one of the you know three or four that we've talked to now that are having a good time and 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 doing the overlanding which uh, of course overlanding means something different to everybody but i think generally i think we know what that means and uh good for you that's really exciting i'm 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 excited by it and (laughs) and also now jealous and i hate you Hey man, come crash on my sofa. I may don't be surprised. I may do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll put the back seat in the rover for you, John. All right. Well, uh, be you careful know. what you get yourself into. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I should say, by the way, if you come to the United States, it, it, uh, now granted we are not close to the border any by any stretch, but you are welcome to the Pittsburgh area, and uh, you have a place to crash also. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> it's a it's a neat place to be. It's not. Uh, it, it, Pittsburgh is an uh, is a is a cool place these days. As long as you can handle the language difference. Yeah, <sighs> language difference. Uh, yeah, there is that, and bad traffic, bad roads. Uh, yeah, that's all. Uh, yeah, but well, it's East Coast, right? I love Pittsburgh. I mean, that whole area is gorgeous up there. Have you been Pittsburgh? Yeah, I haven't been probably in ten years, but yes, I have. I've been Good. to Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. Good. Yeah, it's beautiful up there. It has. Uh, probably- go ahead. I was going to say I probably was there in the in the Defender, and we and we and, didn't and we didn't see and you. we didn't see you. Wait, you usually we track them all. We we see them. Yes, we, we keep tabs on every last <laughs> Defender do, in the area. Do. <laughs> well, you know, go ahead. I was in Philadelphia, and I think there was a an owner of the restaurant. There was a nice restaurant, and the owner had a beautiful bottle green series Land Rover. But I'm pretty sure it was Philadelphia, not Pittsburgh. It's just gorgeous. Well, we have a couple of those here too. Yes, we are like stalkers for all the old uh, old Land Rovers around we here. Are. Well, uh, Harold and I are also in a local Land Rover club. It's called the Fort Pitt Land Rover Group uh, here in the Pittsburgh area. And uh, uh, yeah, so on that on our we have a forum, and on that we're always we have a special sighting section. So when someone sees something they haven't seen before, who owns that? Where did that come from? Yeah, <laughs> we, we like to keep track of these things. Yes, and the funny thing is that quite often I, I somebody the in the thing, club definitely. knows it. That's true. We do know, and, and yeah, yeah. There's there's not that many, so we do all know where they are, and it's right. And I do the same thing down here. I photograph just about everything I can. We need to get you up here to photograph our trucks. That'd be cool. I would love to. <laughs> you have a 109 X Military of Defense. Yeah, I, yeah. I have a I have a Series Three 109 uh, XMOD. It actually served at the British Territorial Army. Wow, very cool. And Harold, do you have a Defender? Uh, I have uh, no, I do not actually. Uh, I have a uh, Series Three One Hundred Nine Ambulance, is my cool. my flagship, and and a number of other things too. Uh, the Defender that uh, I think maybe where you're getting that from is we. Uh, I w- had a Defender in my custody at the uh, British Car Day show last weekend, but that actually belongs to a customer of mine. That was it. Okay, cool. Wow, that ambulance sounds amazing. Well, it's it's interesting. <laughs> It is interesting. We he took an off road. Uh, it's been four or five years now, and uh, probably a place we shouldn't have taken that specific vehicle. But it almost toppled, and we have a, a really good picture of a friend of ours who's also in uh, charge of our local club, and he's sitting on the fender on the on the wing trying to balance it out while we get toe straps in place. <laughs> it's just uh, yeah, that yeah. Was... That that big box out back doesn't really help you when you're in the woods. 
Sean, you're uh, you're going to be traveling, and we're going to keep abreast of that uh, through all your your websites and your social medias. And I want to thank you for joining us on the podcast today and taking the time to talk with us. See, we had a little bit of technical problems, so hopefully uh, the end result will sound okay. Uh, and uh, really want to thank you for for joining us. It was great to talk with you, and uh, you are certainly welcome to come to visit with us and uh, and and bring your truck though. Your truck actually is probably more welcome than you are. Yeah, yeah. D- more don't, important. Don't come without okay. your truck. <laughs> if you come without Thank your truck, you we're sending yeah. you back. <laughs> cool. Yes. No, we'll be exploring Mexico for a little while longer until we head further south. And we'll be publishing everything we do on SeanAndMitty.com as well as through the magazines. Magazine. So please do stay tuned. And we can hear your dog drinking in the background. Yes, Switters is thirsty. <laughs> what, what's the dog's name? Switters. Switters. Yes. Well, hi, Switters. What kind of dog? He's a mix. He's a German Shepherd Sharpe Pitbull mix. He's about eight, and he's a, he's a beautiful guy. Does he like the Rover? He loves the Rover, actually. That's always yeah. good to have a yeah, Rover dog. a smart dog. Yeah. yeah. He loves to travel. He loves to stick his head out. Yeah, he loves it. Oh, excellent! I don't think I saw any pictures of the dog. I have to I have to go through your photos better to see. Is there one? You know, that's a good point. I might I might have to post something of Switters. You got to do that. Let's do that. There we go. The podcast has achieved something. We're going to get a picture of the dog. <laughs> picture of Switters. Wonderful. Coming right away at request of. Well, thanks again, Sean. Really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it, it's uh, your couple hours, I think, behind us in Mexico, and I'm sure you could have been doing something more interesting than talking to us in my basement. Uh, but uh, thanks very much for joining us on the show today. It was a pleasure. Thank you guys very much. And that brings us to a close of the 28th edition of the Center Steer Podcast. I want to thank everybody for listening. And don't forget, we're part of the 4x4 Radio Network. Go out to the 4x4radio.com. Listen to the other shows on the network. And uh, check out our website for uh, the show notes on this particular episode, including all the things that uh, Sean mentioned for his website and how to check track him down. Uh, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, otherwise, we will talk with you next month for another edition of the Center Steer Podcast. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you. The Center Steer theme song, Sunset Rider by the Triton, is available from Nivio's Music Alley. Check it out at music.nivio.com. Son, get a real job.